Welcome to Get Licensed to Build. This is a free online workshop for those who want to get their California contractor's license. Our goal this morning is to go through all parts of the license application and give you practical tips to help you complete it correctly and to give you every opportunity to demonstrate your experience and qualifications to get your California contractor's license. We will also help you get ready for your licensing exams and give you a link to a video that shows you exactly what to expect on your test day. Today's webcast is presented by the Contractor State License Board, the government agency responsible for regulating California's construction industry. Good morning. CSLB is overseen by a 15-member board that directs administrative policy for our operations. Our board is made up of 10 public members, including one labor representative, one local building official, and one representative of a statewide senior citizen organization, and five contractors. Appointments are made by the governor and the state legislature. If you're watching right now on either YouTube Live or Facebook Live and want to ask questions, you'll need to join us on WebEx. There's a banner with a link on the top of our homepage, cslb.ca.gov. That's also where you can download this presentation to follow along. The presentation file includes clickable bonus links that appear on slides throughout this workshop. We're going to present a lot of information today, so don't worry if you don't get it. We will archive the video of this workshop and put it on our YouTube channel so you can go back and watch it again. To ask a question on WebEx, use the Q&A feature, not the chat feature, on the bottom right of your screen. Make sure you send your questions to all panelists. Finally, we tend to get a lot of questions during these workshops on how you can document your work experience and what credit you can get for your education or military service. Those questions are fine, but we would ask that you wait to send us those questions until after you see that part of the workshop. We will go through your questions at the end of our presentation, which should last about 45 minutes. The information obtained during this webcast is not, nor is intended to be legal advice. While this webcast contains general information, including legal guidelines for contractor license applications, it does not contain definitive statements of the law and may not reflect the most current legal developments in the construction industry. Such guidelines communicated or discussed during the webcast are for informational purposes only. If you have questions about the application of the law for specific situations, you should contact an attorney who is familiar with California construction law or review the latest edition of the CSLB publication, California Contractors License Law and Reference Book. You can download it for free on the CSLB website or purchase it directly from the publisher, LexisNexis. There are links for both at the bottom of the screen. Here's a list of what we're going to cover today. We will take you through the process of applying for your California contractor's license. First, who needs a license? Why get a contractor's license? The minimum qualifications you need to get a license and what credits you might qualify for. The types of business entities. The different CSLB license classifications, including our new B2 residential remodeling classification. We will spend a lot of time giving you tips on how to help fill out your applications, including how to demonstrate your work experience to meet the minimum qualifications. Fingerprint requirements for a criminal background check. We will help you get ready for the exam or exams you'll need to pass in order to get your license. And finally, the other things you'll need to have in place before your license is issued, things like bond and insurance. First, we'll look at who needs a license. Here in California, a state contractor's license is needed for all construction projects priced at $500 or more. That includes both labor and materials, no matter who purchases the materials. The law doesn't let you break down a project into $499 pieces. It's an entire project. Also, you can't charge an hourly rate to get around the $500 threshold. If the hourly cost times the number of hours for the job totals $500 or more, you need a contractor's license. So what is the definition of a contractor? The definition comes from the state's business and professions code. In this case, it's section 7026.1. We've got a link to that code at the top of the page if you download the presentation. I'll read the entire code, but pay special attention to the part we underlined. A contractor is any person consultant to an owner builder, firm, association, organization, partnership, business trust, corporation, or a company who or which undertakes, offers to undertake, purports to have the capacity to undertake, or submits a bid to construct any building or home improvement project or part thereof. In other words, you don't have to do the work to break the law. You must have a contractor's license just to advertise that you can do the construction work. 
or even to give a bid for a construction job if the bid totals $500 or more. So you may be asking yourself, why should I get a license? Here are a few good reasons. First, you can take pride in being a licensed professional. It shows you've taken the steps to get licensed and you're serious about your career choice. It allows you to make valuable contributions to your local community. Unlicensed contractors must operate in the shadows and cannot help make their community a better place to live. Next, it allows you to get paid for the work you do. There is value to the work done by a licensed professional. Being licensed also gives you legal options if customers don't pay you. Unlicensed contractors do not have a legal right to take someone to court to get paid because the work required a license and they weren't licensed to do the work in the first place. Also, you would be able to use the mechanics lien laws. Next, you don't have to look over your shoulder with fear of getting caught. Contracting without a valid California license can lead to misdemeanor charges. Those caught face a first offense sentence of up to six months in jail and or a $5,000 fine and potential administrative fines anywhere between $200 and $15,000. Subsequent violations can result in increased criminal penalties and fines. In addition, you may face felony charges if you contract without a license where one is required in a state or federally declared disaster area, or if you try to pass yourself off as a licensed contractor by illegally using a license number. Remember, there are no educational requirements to get a license. Also, you don't have to go to a license preparation school to get your contractor's license. So, what do you need to get your license? First, it's important to understand that CSLB does not license individuals. We license companies or businesses, also called entities. Many entities are one-person operations, but know that every entity, even a one-person operation, must have a qualifier. That's someone who has the minimum experience and is responsible for the operations of the company. Here is the short list of minimum qualifications you will need. You must be at least 18 years of age. You must have either a valid social security number or a valid individual taxpayer identification number or ITIN. You can qualify the license in one of two ways. First, you can qualify the license by having at least four years experience within the last 10 years as a journey person, four person, supervising employee, or contractor in the trade being applied for. Or you can also get a qualifier for the license who has that required experience. We will spend time talking about how you can demonstrate your experience on your application later in this presentation. It may be possible for you to substitute your education, technical training, and apprenticeship training for some of the required experience. We tend to get a lot of questions on this. First, CSLB cannot prejudge your experience. Due to the number of applications we receive and process every month, we don't have the staff time that would be needed to prejudge your experience. We can only review your documents after you apply for your license. Next, to get education credit, the coursework must be directly related to the work you will be doing as a contractor. Your education cannot be substituted for more than three years or 36 months of the required experience, meaning you will need at least one year of practical experience if you get the full 36 months of education credit. To apply for education credit, you must provide CSLB with written documentation. That means a copy of any apprenticeship completion certificates you earned or get official technical school or college transcripts. Have your transcripts mailed to you. Do not open the envelope, leave it sealed, and include it with your CSLB applications packet. Note that high school courses will not earn you any credit towards your contractor's license. If you are looking to get education credit to meet the four years or 48 months of experience, you need to get your transcripts first. This is the kind of credit you can expect to receive for your education. Note that for some areas, we are only giving you averages. You will see that your credit will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. We're not going to be able to give you any more guidance than what you see on this slide. So, our best advice is do not rely on the combination of your experience and education credits to barely hit the four-year experience mark. There is always a real possibility you will not get as much education credit as you are hoping. Let's go through the chart from the most credit you can get to the least. The most education credit you can get is for a Bachelor's of Science degree in Construction Management. That degree will get you the full 36 months of credit. Next is a Master's or Bachelor degree in Business or a Law degree. Any one of those will get you 24 months of credit. An associate in science degree in construction management will get you 18 months credit. A bachelor's degree in some other major will get you an average of 18 months credit. 
An associate degree in a major besides construction management will get you an average of six months credit. Credit for individual college classes is given on a case-by-case -case basis, usually with a maximum of six months credit. Apprenticeship completion certificates will get you 24 to 36 months, depending on the classification of the program. For example, a sheet metal worker's apprenticeship gets you 24 months credit for the C20 HVAC and the C43 sheet metal classifications only. A lineman apprenticeship gets you 36 months in C7 low voltage and C10 electrical classifications only. If you have transcripts for other technical training you've taken, you might be able to get some minimal credit as well. Again, don't use your education credits to try and squeak by the four year or 48 month requirement. If you served in the military, some of that service might count as well. On the bottom of the page, you'll see a bonus link to our CSLB Military Application Assistance Program where you can learn more. The license qualifier also must pass two different exams, both taken on a computer at one of CSLB's authorized test centers. One exam is on California business law. The other is in the specific trade covered by the license. We also have limited specialty licenses, which we'll discuss later. Those licenses only require the qualifier to take the law and business exam. As mentioned, the qualifier is the one who must take and pass the required exams or qualify for a waiver. We're not going to spend a lot of time on a waiver, only to note that you might be able to request a waiver from taking one or both exams in very specific situations. We recommend that you look at the CSLB website for more information on those specific situations. We have included a bonus link at the bottom of the page. The qualifier must undergo a criminal background check. We will go more in depth on that in a few minutes. After the license is issued, the qualifier must be in a position to exercise direct supervision and control of the company's operations. They are also responsible for all workmanship issues. It's also important to note here that if you're trying to get a B General Building Contractor license and you hire subcontractors to work under you, you're responsible as the project's prime contractor for the work that they do. The next thing you're going to need to determine before applying for your license is what type of entity your business will be. There are four types. First is a sole ownership, where the owner or responsible managing employee may serve as the license qualifier. Just about two thirds of the contracting businesses in California are sole ownerships. Second, a corporation, where either of the current officers designated as the responsible managing officer or the responsible managing employee may serve as a qualifier. Just under one third of our licensees are corporations. A distant third is a partnership, where either of the general partners or responsible managing employee may serve as a qualifier. That's 2% of our licensees. Finally, a limited liability company or LLC, where a responsible managing member, responsible managing manager, responsible managing officer, or a responsible managing employee may serve as a qualifier. About one and a half percent of California construction companies are LLCs. Now, let's talk about license classifications. A contractor's license can include multiple classifications, although you must select one when filling out your application. While there are more than 40 license classifications in California, they all fall under three distinct categories. There's a bonus link to our classifications list at the bottom of this screen. First is Class A, or General Engineering Contractors. These are contractors who deal with fixed works that require specialized engineering knowledge and skill. A contractors are the ones who build projects such as freeways, skyscrapers, and dams. Today, there are over 19,000 A contractors in the state. Next is Class B, or General Building Contractors. This is the largest class of contractors in California, with more than 133,000. B contractors have a principal business dealing with any structure built, being built, or to be built that requires as part of its construction at least two unrelated building trades or crafts. In other words, a B contractor shouldn't take a prime contract for any project involving trades other than framing or carpentry unless the prime contract requires at least two unrelated building trades other than framing or carpentry. There is no limitation on B contractors to stop them from taking on projects that only include framing or carpentry. The final class is C or specialty contractors. These licenses are for construction work that requires special skill and whose principal contracting business involves the use of specialized building trades or crafts. Examples from this class include C10 electrical contractors, C20 HVAC contractors, C27 landscaping contractors, 
C36 plumbing contractors, C39 roofing contractors, C46 solar contractors, and C53 swimming pool contractors, just to name a few. There are also 30 limited specialty classes under the C61 classification. These include the C61 D34 prefabricated equipment class. More than 209,000 contractors hold a C license in California. CSLB's newest licensing classification is called the B2 Residential Remodeling Classification. The B2 allows contractors who don't have structural framing experience to get a license with CSLB. Here's what interested applicants need to know. B2 license holders must engage in three or more trades or crafts on a residential project. B2 licensees also are limited to working on existing residential wood frame structures. There are some things B2 license holders cannot do. They cannot make structural alterations to load-bearing partitions and walls. They cannot install or extend electrical or plumbing systems. They can make modifications to existing systems, for example, install recessed lighting or alter plumbing for two showerheads. B2 licensees also cannot install or replace an HVAC system. Like all other CSLB licensees, B2 applicants licensees must comply with CSLB experience, examination, license bond, and workers' compensation insurance requirements. If you have more questions about the B2 license, email the classifications deputy at classifications at cslb.ca.gov. When you're ready to apply for a license, here are the two forms you will need. On the left is the license application. On the right is the certification of work experience. You can get these forms on the CSLB website. There's a bonus link on the left side of the page, so be sure to download this presentation. We will give you a closer look at the different sections of these forms a little later. Okay, now let's break down the steps of the application process. First, identify who will be the qualifier for your license. That person will be responsible for exercising direct supervision and control of the company. If you're using an RME or responsible managing employee as your qualifier, determine if they can qualify for an exam waiver. Be aware of companies you pay to connect you with a license qualifier. In some cases, these qualifiers cannot exercise the direct supervision needed, or they aren't willing, or don't understand their role as a qualifier. Next, make sure you complete the correct application. There are two options. One, application for original contractor license. Two, application for original contractor license, examination waiver, 7065. We have a link to the forms and applications webpage at the bottom of this page. The next step is to determine your company name. See the application instructions for examples. Some things to keep in mind. Your name cannot be misleading or imply that you qualify for a license classification other than what you're getting. For example, if you're going to apply for a C36 plumbing license, you cannot have a company of John Smith Plumbing Construction, Heating and Drywall. Corporate and LLC names must match exactly the name registered with the California Secretary of State's office. You can also use what is called a DBA, which stands for Doing Business As. The main things to remember here is the DBA name cannot be misleading, and you must use that name in all advertising and on all your contracts. Next, you'll want to get together certifications to support your work experience. You should do this even if you apply for an exam waiver. Feel free to use multiple pages if necessary. Next, be sure to note if you're a military veteran. Some of your military service may be used to meet your four years of experience qualifications. Also, your application may be expedited and receive a possible 50% reduction in your initial licensing fee through our Military Application Assistance Program. There's a bonus link at the bottom of the screen for more information on that program. To participate, you must have not been dishonorably discharged. Be sure to include a copy of your latest DD-214 long form paperwork showing your discharge status with your application. The next couple of items are basic but important. Proofread your application for any missing information. Make sure you have provided an answer to all necessary fields. Second, don't forget to sign and date the application. Finally, determine if you need special accommodations to take your exams. If so, complete a request form and submit it with your application. We'll talk about the use of translators a little later. Next, let's take a closer look at our fingerprint requirements, which are used for a criminal background check. This is a list of those who must submit a full set of fingerprints to CSLB, depending on the type of business entity. All applicants, each corporate officer, each member and manager, each partner, each owner, the responsible managing employee, all home improvement salespersons. 
If you are in California, you must submit fingerprints electronically with what's called LiveScan. You can get an updated list of LiveScan locations in California, broken down by county, on the Attorney General's website. We have a link here, or you can simply go to the Attorney General's website and search for LiveScan. You will also see we have a bonus link at the bottom of the screen to the fingerprint information page on our CSLB website. If you are out of state, it's a longer process to get us your fingerprints. That's because you must submit hard copies of them the old-fashioned way. Those take anywhere between three and six months for the FBI and Department of Justice to process. So you might want to consider traveling to California to get your electronic live scan done here. So what happens if you have any criminal convictions? CSLB may deny your license for the following reasons. First, if your conviction is substantially related to the duties, functions, and qualifications of a contractor. Also, if your conviction involves fraud or a violent crime. There are other factors CSLB also considers, which are the nature and severity of the crimes, the amount of time that has passed since a conviction, and any evidence of rehabilitation that you submit to CSLB. CSLB evaluates felony criminal convictions which occurred within seven years of the application date. For misdemeanor criminal convictions, we would look back for three years of the application date. That's unless the convictions are for a violent felony, certain sexual crimes, or financial crimes related to construction. CSLB denies only 1% of the total applications we get based on criminal convictions. You'll also note the bonus link to our fingerprint information page. Okay, along with the education credits we talked about earlier, this next section is probably the most important of the entire workshop and the part of the application that causes the most questions for applicants. It is how you demonstrate your work experience on your application. Remember, the license qualifier needs four years or 48 months of experience within the past 10 years in the classification for which you're applying. The experience must be no less than a journeyman level or as a foreman, supervising employee, contractor, or owner builder. A journeyman is defined as an experienced worker who is fully qualified as opposed to a trainee who can perform the trade without supervision or one who's completed an apprenticeship program. There's a limited amount of space on the application to show your certified work experience. So feel free to use additional pages if needed and simply attach them at the end of the work experience form. Use as many certifications of work experience forms as you need to prove the required four years of experience within the last 10 years. Use a different form for each certifier. Be as accurate as possible. Make sure the person certifying your work describes the actual work you performed and the dates in which you performed them. We will now share some examples of both good and unacceptable descriptions to demonstrate your work experience. Do not copy and paste this information directly into your application. These are just examples. At the top of this chart is the classification and type of experience you're trying to demonstrate. This first example is journey person experience. The overall theme we'll keep repeating is the more specific the description, the better. Note, the work experience form should be completed by your certifier, someone who has knowledge and has observed your work experience for the classification you're applying for. That person does not have to be a licensed contractor. Our first example is for the Class B General Building Contractor. The best type of description your certifier would use for a journey person experience is to be specific. Journey person experience must include hands-on work like this. Bob performed rough and finished carpentry, concrete forming and pours, rough out plumbing and electrical, interior exterior painting, and flooring on residential homes. An unacceptable description would be something generic like residential general building trades. For four-person experience, the description must include some hands-on work and or supervisory work. Here's an example of the best type of description. Bob oversaw other staff at job site performing rough and finished carpentry, concrete forming and pours, rough out plumbing and electrical, interior exterior painting and flooring on residential homes. Again, an unacceptable description would be something generic like residential general building trades. For supervising employee experience, the description should include an explanation of how you arrived at a supervisor level. An example is, as a construction lead on multiple projects, Bob supervised rough and finished carpentry, concrete forming and pours, rough out plumbing and electrical, interior exterior painting, and flooring on residential homes. For out-of-state contractor experience, the description must include examples of work done that were out-of-state, military, on federal lands, or work for a government entity. 
Applicants can qualify as a journey person, four-person, or supervising employee. A tip, be specific about your duties and employment circumstances. Our next example is for the C27 landscaping contractor. The best type of description your certifier would use would be, Jane performed landscape construction, maintenance and installation of sprinklers, ground plants, low voltage lighting, ornamental yard art, concrete mow strips and pathways, and tree pruning. An unacceptable explanation would be gardening, yard maintenance, planting. For a C27 landscaping foreperson, the description should indicate overseeing other staff performing the trades. And for the C27 supervising employee, the description should include an explanation of how you arrived at the supervisor level for the trades on a project. Finally, for our out-of-state contractors, the same guidance that we showed you for general building contractors is required. Be sure to include examples of your out-of-state work as well as work for the military, on federal lands, or for a government entity. Be sure to be specific when you describe your duties and employment circumstances. By law, CSLB must randomly review and verify all information provided on at least 3% of our applications. Our next three slides run down the acceptable documentation you can use to support your work experience in the event that your application was selected and you were asked to provide additional documentation. The supporting documentation should not be mailed in with your application. You will only need to provide this information if requested by CSLB staff. On the lower right of the screen, you'll see a link to this publication on our website along with additional information on experienced documentation. If you look at the chart, you can see the first column is for documents you can use if you were employed by a licensed contractor. The second column is for documenting your experience if you've been self-employed. The third column is for documentation you will need if you're applying for a Class B general building contractor license and need to use the owner builder experience to meet the experience requirements. Here's the next page of acceptable documentation. Again, you can click on the link to view and print this publication. If you don't have this information readily available, you may want to begin to gather it now, just in case you're asked to provide it in the future. Remember, you are trying to demonstrate four years of experience within the last 10 years. CSLB may contact the certifier of experience or other parties to verify experience. One other note, CSLB gets more than 1,000 applications each month, so our application processing staff has seen it all. They've got two pieces of advice. First, don't cut and paste from this presentation. Also, don't try to get around having to take a trade test by applying for multiple subcategories under the C61 limited specialty classification. Okay, that is the content you'll need to fill out your application. Before getting it to CSLB, double check it to make sure you didn't miss anything. Be sure to sign and date it as well. Parts of the application section one, business name and address. Now that we've gone through the information you'll need to include, here's a closer look at the application so you can see where the information goes. Section one is where you list your business name. Remember, when selecting a business name, make sure the name you selected is compatible with the classification and entity that you're applying for and is not misleading. If your business is a corporation or LLC, you will need to make sure that the name you provide in this section matches exactly the business name registered with the Secretary of State. In line two, you will indicate what classification you're applying for. The mailing address and phone number that you list on line 3A and 3C will be made public on CSLB's website once you are licensed. In section two, you will select your business entity. If you're applying as a corporation or LLC, you will need to provide your registration number provided to you by the Secretary of State. Make sure to pay extra attention to the instructions in this section pertaining to the entity for which you're applying. Section three, qualifying individual full legal name and address. In section three, you will list the qualifier's information. Remember, the qualifier is the person that meets the experience requirements and will be responsible for the direct supervision and control of construction operations. The qualifier will be the person taking the exams. On line six, you will list any previous or current license numbers you've held. You will also need to list the percentage of the new business owned by the qualifier. On line seven, you will need to indicate what position will be held by the qualifier. Each entity has different personnel requirements. You will need to make sure that you've listed all positions depending on the entity you have selected. You can find more information on this on pages two through four of the application instructions. Line eight is where you will sign and date your application. Section four, personnel, full legal names and addresses. Section four is where you'll list the personnel information for all remaining personnel that will be listed on the license. 
For example, if you're applying for a corporation, you'll need to indicate who will be the responsible managing officer or employee, president, secretary, and treasurer. Again, more information can be found on page 6 of the application instructions. If you'll have more than four people on your license, you can make additional copies of this page and include it with your application. For corporations and LLCs, every person who is an officer, responsible manager or member, or director of a corporation or limited liability company shall be listed on the application as a member of the personnel of record for the license. All personnel that will be listed on the license must sign the application in Section 4. Section 5 is a series of yes and no questions, so we're not going to cover those here. Section 6, Qualifier Education, Apprenticeship, Licensure, and Military. You may be granted credit towards the four-year experience requirement based on your education. Question 17 asks if you have completed an educational or apprenticeship program. You will need to submit official sealed transcripts if you would like to be considered for educational credit. If you attended formal training or an apprenticeship program, you will need to provide a certificate of completion. Get those sealed transcripts mailed to you, then include the sealed transcripts with your application packet. Do not have the program send transcripts directly to CSLB. You don't want to take a chance that we're not able to match them up with your application. CSLB may grant you up to three years of credit based on your education. This credit is not on a year-to-year -year basis, meaning if you have a two-year college degree, you won't necessarily be granted two years of credit towards the experience requirement. You may qualify for this credit regardless of when you completed your education. The 10-year time frame does not apply to education. You may also apply for this credit even if your education was received out of the country. If your degree is in any other language other than English, it must be translated and evaluated by an accredited evaluation service that does business with the United States. Parts of the application, Certification of Work Experience, Part 1. Now we'll discuss the Certification of Work Experience. Part 1 will be filled out by you, the applicant. Here you will list the information about your employer where you gained your experience. If you were self-employed when you gained the experience, please make sure to check the box in line 2. If you are applying for a B general construction license and will be using experience obtained while working on your own property, make sure to mark the box in line 4 and complete an owner builder construction project experience form that we'll discuss later. Certification of Work Experience Part 2 Part 2 will be filled out by the certifier. In this section, the certifier must include the dates in which you obtained the experience. They must also select if you were working on a part-time or full-time basis. Keep in mind, if you were working part-time, you will receive 50% credit for that time, which means you will need to provide eight years of experience within the last 10 years to meet the four-year requirement. On line six, your certifier will need to list the duties that you performed or supervised that are considered relatable for the classification that you are applying for. You can read a description of trade duties in CSLB's Description of Classifications booklet available on our website. Do not copy and paste the description from the booklet. This is only to give you an idea of what CSLB considers related trade duties for each classification. Your certifier should complete this section in their own words and be as complete and accurate as possible. Certification of Work Experience, final part. The final part of the Work Experience Certificate is also to be completed by your certifier. They need to list their relationship to you and provide their contact information. Lastly, they will need to sign and date the certification. Parts of the application, Owner Builder B General Building Construction Project Experience, Part 1 of 3. The next form we will discuss is the Owner Builder B General Building Construction Project Experience form. This form only needs to be completed if you're applying for a B General Construction License and you want to receive experience credit for working on projects on your own property. A separate form is required for each project. The experience must be verifiable through building permits, final inspections, and other documentation. You will need to list the building permit number on line 6. On line 7, you will need to provide the scope of the project. Owner Builder B General Building Construction Project Experience 2 of 3. In boxes 8 through 10, you will need to provide more detailed information about the project. Owner Builder B General Building Construction Project Experience 3 of 3. Question 11 asks if other general construction contractors worked on the project and what trades they performed. Remember, this information should be as complete and accurate as possible. With all the information we just covered, this is a good time to remind you that we're recording this workshop. 
We'll post the video on our YouTube channel so you can go back and rewatch it in case there's anything you missed. Okay, so you've got your application submitted. How do you check the status of that application? Here are two resources. First is the secured check. You'll need your application fee number and contractor PIN number to get an update. We'll send you that information after we receive, cashier, and key into the system your completed application. The second way to check is to look online at our processing times. Each week, we update our website with the date we receive the paperwork for a specific process. So look for the date being worked on and know that if the date shown is after the date we likely received your paperwork, it's likely we're busy working on your application. As you can imagine, CSLB receives hundreds, if not thousands of documents every day and we process them in the order they're received. So be sure to take extra time getting the application right so we don't have to send it back to you to correct and then start processing your application again. When your application has been posted, CSLB will send you a notice to schedule for examination and a study guide. You may then schedule your exams through the online scheduling process. CSLB has many authorized test centers throughout California and encourages candidates to take their exams at their nearest test center. If you're an applicant whose first language isn't English and you don't feel confident taking your exams in English, we do allow you to use a translator. The translator, who you provide, simply reads you the exam questions. The CSLB Law and Business exam is now available in Spanish. There's a link at the bottom of the page to read more about this new option. Question 16 on the application asks if you need to use a translator to complete the examination and the language the exam will be translated into. The translator must be approved by CSLB in advance. You cannot just show up on the day of your examination to the test center with someone to translate the exam for you. When you have an exam date, make sure you don't miss it. If you fail to appear for your exam, you'll have to pay a non-refundable $100 fee to reschedule. That fee may be waived once with documented evidence of a medical emergency or circumstance beyond your control. Also, we have study guides available for each of our exams. Included in each study guide, you'll find a list of sections and topics covered by the exam. They also include sample questions, how each section of the exam is weighted, and recommended resources that you can use to prepare for the examination. These study guides are available online on our website. There's a bonus link to them on the bottom of the screen. These study guides are also available in Spanish. Here's a quick look at two of those study guides. The first is the Law and Business exam, which all qualifiers must take, no matter which license classification, including the D series limited classes. You can see the guide contains a breakdown of examination topics, some test strategies, sample questions, and resources that were used to help create that exam. You will see the same format on the B General Building Study Guide. We would recommend that you really pay attention to the exam content here, especially how we have broken down what percentage of questions there will be on each of the five topics on the exam. On the lower right of both of these two slides, you'll see bonus links to the actual study guide, as well as a link to the complete list of study guides. On your testing day, plan to arrive at least 15 minutes early for your exam. Give yourself extra time to get checked in. Follow the instructions provided online when scheduling your exam date. We've also produced a short what to expect on test day video that you can watch on our YouTube channel. The link is at the bottom of your screen. You'll take your exam on a computer using a keyboard and mouse. Before starting, you'll see an on-screen tutorial that'll take you through the process. The exam itself consists of multiple choice questions. You'll also see a space on each question where you can, if you want, submit a comment about that question. You'll get three and a half hours to complete each exam. Don't arrive late or that may reduce the amount of time you get to complete your exam or you may not be admitted to the exam and will have to reschedule. You will get your results at the end of the exam. If you don't pass the exam, you will not be allowed to review the questions you missed, but you will get a statement showing how you did on each section of the exam. You can reschedule the exam as many times as you need within the 18-month period as long as you pay the non-refundable $100 rescheduling fee each time. Each rescheduled test must be at least three weeks following the previous test per rescheduling guidelines. After you pass your exams, what happens next? First, you'll need to pay your initial license fee, $200 for a sole owner license and $350 for a non-sole owner license. That will be good for two years. You'll also need to complete an online asbestos open book exam. Plus, you'll need to file your required $25,000 contractor surety bond and possibly other bonds depending on what type of business entity you'll have. If you've got employees, you'll need to get workers' compensation insurance. 
If you don't have employees, you must file a workers' compensation exemption with CSLB. You can also submit this online. If you're going to be an LLC, you'll also need liability insurance. See our website for more information. Your insurance company or broker can submit your insurance information to CSLB directly on our website. Please note that workers' compensation insurance is also required for all contractors applying for the C8 concrete, C20 warm air heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, C22 asbestos abatement, C39 roofing, and C61 D49 tree service classifications, regardless of whether they have any employees. Effective January 1st, 2026, all licensees will be required to carry workers' compensation insurance regardless of the classification or whether they have any employees. In about five to 10 business days after your license has been issued, CSLB will send you a wall certificate and plastic pocket license card. Display the wall certificate in your main office or chief place of business. Carry your pocket card with you, especially in situations where you're going to solicit business, talk to potential customers, or sign contracts. We encourage consumers to ask to see your pocket license. If you're going to have salespeople working for you, be sure to get them registered as a home improvement salesperson with CSLB. Check our website for more information on how to do that. Your license will be good for two years. It'll expire on the last day of the month when it was issued. Be sure to put that expiration date in your calendar, in your phone, anywhere you need so you won't forget it. CSLB will send you a renewal notice in the mail approximately 60 days before it expires but ultimately it is your responsibility to renew your license on time. Here are a couple of other important deadlines to keep in mind. First, notify CSLB within 90 days if you move or change your business address. Your renewal notice will be sent to the address of record that we have on file. If you're not at that address anymore, you're probably not going to get it. Plus, the Postal Service will not forward state government mail. Finally, notify CSLB within 90 days of all changes to personnel on your license especially when it involves the qualifier of the license. Once you get your license and get to work, you might want to hire someone as a salesperson to solicit, sell, and negotiate home improvement contracts on your behalf outside of your place of business. These people are called Home Improvement Salespersons, or HIS. Without an HIS, the official personnel of record on a license are the only ones who can solicit, sell, negotiate, or execute a contract. That includes individual contractors, license qualifiers, partners, corporation officers, and LLC responsible managing officers, members, managers, or employees. A HIS can work for more than one contractor. The licensee must notify CSLB when they either associate or disassociate an HIS with their license. This process can now be completed online as well. There are a couple exceptions to note. First are those who only schedule appointments for the contractor or registered HIS and bona fide service and repair people. These are the folks you call out for repairs, including things like air conditioning, heating, and plumbing. But those services and repair people are limited to the work that was initially requested by the buyer or homeowner. For example, if your AC goes out and you call an HVAC company to come out, the service person does not have to be a registered salesperson. But if they go beyond the repair itself and sell you a new HVAC system, they will have to be a registered HIS. Also, don't employ an unregistered salesperson. That subjects you to administrative discipline, and the salesperson might get a citation or possibly even a criminal misdemeanor. We've got bonus links at the bottom of this page if you want to look at the actual code sections of law.